We're in a cultural moment where innovation is outpacing our sense of purpose and meaning. So in such a context, who do we look to for counsel? Who do we look to for recommendations? What do we do? Hello and welcome to Thinking Out Loud. I'm your co-host, Cameron McAllister. And I'm your co-host, Nathan Rittenhouse. Artificial intelligence. Here we go again. Well, it sounds old-fashioned if you say it like that. (laughs) In my day, we called it artificial intelligence. But I wanted to talk about AI again, Nathan, real quickly, because there's I came across an article in The New Atlantis, which is a publication we read with some frequency because it's good. And we'll link to this article in the show notes. But essentially, it's a proposal. And it reminded me of something I had forgotten about. So during the the Bush administration, or the Bush era, rather, I had forgotten that a bioethics council was appointed. And this this goes along along with a little bit more of a, a conservative approach to burgeoning technology. So rather than just looking at this in terms of government regulation, all right, we have this emerging field very cutting edge, and the implications of it are just astounding. So therefore, we just need to take an instrumental approach and just figure out ways to regulate this technology. So that's that would be typically, I think, more more kind of democratic or progressive approach to it. But this this one said, no, let's we're going to appoint this council, a very diverse council of people, not just leading experts in the medical field, but also ethicists, philosophers, people like that, to put their heads together, think about this new technology, and make recommendations. Not mandates, but rec- recommendations. And two interesting examples, there were some times where this, this council were united, and then there were other times when they were, they were divided. I mean, these were very strong-minded people. Um, on one occasion, so on the issue of human cloning, should that ever become possible, this council recommended that it was unethical in all circumstances and should be, you know, laws should be made against it, you know, full stop. But when it came to using cloning technologies with with animals and other li- other living organisms for the purposes of research, they were a ha- they were a house divided. They were about fifty fifty on that one. So. The author of this article is recommending that something like that needs to happen with AI. But he he actually says the situation of, of AI is unique because this is a technology that really brings to the forefront questions of what it actually means to be human in the first place. But he also argues that just government regulation isn't going to be sufficient to meet these challenges. And by the way, that is what... That's what the the Biden administration is doing so far. They're they're really going down the, the road of regulation. But he's recommending, no, 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 we need a field of a diverse field of experts. Yes, computer scientists and and leading technologists, people like that, but also, you know, logicians, mathematicians, humanities people, that kind of thing. You need a diverse council who can put their heads together, think through these thorny issues, and make recommendations. So that we can be informed. Because he basically just says the moral complexity of AI is enormous. The benefits will be huge, but so will the challenges. And many of them we won't even, we can't even begin to wrap our heads around this. And he also points out that, and we should, we'll get into this a little bit more, Nathan, but even the basic questions when it comes to AI, like what is it, are still not uncontroversial. We're still having serious discussions about that. So basically, he just says we need we need to have a, a kind of a hum. I don't know, for lack of a better, for lack of a better word, a little bit more of a humanities approach almost to this issue. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was really sound counsel. It made a lot of sense to me, and I thought it was a good, solid proposal for. I mean, honestly, we should be thinking along these lines more anyway. He points out, he gives us some asides that it would have been helpful had we done this, say, with social media, for instance. Mm-hmm. And 
you know, because look at look at how far we've we've come there. Look at all of the the studies that are confirming. Yes, turns out this is actually this can have some profoundly harmful psychological consequences. So this seems to me a really helpful proposal. But there's one issue, Nathan. Here's where I want to get you to chime in. He points out we need to have a discussion about the ends, the telos, and he applies this specifically to human life. We need to have discussions about the purpose of human life. And there, I don't want to be cynical. There, I think we're going to encounter some very serious problems because we are in a state right now where it is nearly, not completely, but it's nearly impossible to reach any consensus on human ends, the purpose of human life. So that's where I think serious difficulty <laughs> lies ahead. How would we even discuss, I mean, what would be a general, how would we generally agree on the purpose of human life? What would be a general consensus of the purpose of human life he even here in the United States? Do you think we could even answer that, answer that question? Yeah. So this is where we get into trouble with, well, it's not trouble. It's just the reality that it is very difficult to develop any moral system without a clear answer to what the purpose of a human is. So those two questions are fundamentally linked at the at the hip. Um, by and large, how you answer questions about the origin and destiny of humanity will have massive implications on what your moral framework is. So there's kind of a vicious loop there that happens that I don't see a way out of um, without a clear vision of what a human is for. You're going to have always come back to disagreeing on the more and it, morality in general and even within ethics is a bit of a mixed bag because you have people who specialize in fields of ethics and those fields of ethics don't even agree with each other all the time on what the right thing to do is right. i remember and then it, 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 so here's the other problem with this is that when you say well the government is you know uh regulating this or putting together an advisory panel or council um those are still humans. It's not like there's a special class of people called the government people who think, or think about like energy regulation, for example, or um, agricultural regulations. Mm. Oftentimes they build those committees out of people who have made a career within those industries. And so it's, it's hard to say that this person has a balanced measured. They have experience in that field, but whether or not they see um, a, a wide angle view of all of the complexity of the issues in that is, is difficult to see. So even within ethics, you're going to have um, people who have their own biases and uh, agendas within that. So, uh, yeah, I, I like the I, I'm I like the idea of an of a diverse advisory council. That that seems to me to be a more safe approach than to say we're going to have a, a government appointed regulatory committee. Um, that's just going to decide everything. Uh, th th the danger there is everybody likes to have like a cut and dry. Here's what you should do. The CDC, the CDC mm -hmm. says yep. do this during COVID um, rather than like, here's the basic information of what we know. And you need to make an informed decision based off of these statistics and, and this amount of knowledge. W to me, one of those seems better than the other, but to other people, they would say, no, why wouldn't we just have the experts tell us what to do? And move forward. So I can I can see those tensions arising, um, even with in, in the attempt to put something together like this. Well, what would we define? How would we define something like even human flourishing? I've come to see that word as somewhat weaselly <laughs> in recent years. I mm -hmm. don't think I'm the only one because I would I would make an informed guess here and say that if you surveyed a significant number of people here around the United States, and this will, this would vary depending on geography, you would get some very different answers on what constitutes human flourishing. I think you'd have a segment who would talk about, spell it out strongly in terms of equality, for instance, and say that, you know, we, we need a, a society where everybody is taken care of. We need, and that needs to be reflected in our economy. That needs to be, be reflected in our healthcare system and so on and so forth. I think you would have that. I think you'd have another segment who would spell it out very clearly in terms of fairness and merit. 
And they would argue, yeah, no, we need we need a society where hard work is rewarded and so on and so forth, where we want to incentivize people to do that good work and be innovative. So you can spell that out clearly in, in political terms. So there's a lot of, there's major disagreement there. There's huge culture warring cool. over flourishing in that sense. I've just politicized it, but we politicize everything. So I've just, that's where I'm trying to problematize some <laughs> yeah. of these words and, and show how they are by no means givens. Well, let's, let's back up a minute because in to some degree, th- this fundamental type of situation is not new. Um, I don't know if he actually said it, but I guess it gets attributed to Nietzsche. The he who has no why has no how. Is that an actual quote or is that just a, so he who has no why no, that is, yep, has no Nietzsche. how. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So think through that sentence mm-hmm. just a second. If you don't know the purpose of something, you don't know the proper way to do it. And, and I think that's just almost a, a tautology. Um, but that's we're we're mm-hmm. running now. I think why AI is is tricky is that let's take let's go back to the bioethics of cloning for for example. We could say okay, we're going to have a debate on the why, but we're pretty clear on how the how works. So when it comes to the the limitations of like the understanding of the bio of the biochemical processes necessary in order to clone something, we know actually how that works and what it is, and we can have a decent guess at what the outcome of this is going to be. So we might disagree on the why, Mm -hmm. but we have clarity on the how. When we shift over into artificial intelligence, I think the fear is that not only do we not have a why, but we also don't have clarity on exactly what the thing is capable of and what the how process actually is. And so it feels like the the boundaries are gone in both of those categories simultaneously, and it makes it very difficult, I would say, particularly from a secular position to find where are we going to put the first ground stake in here in order to um, develop anything meaningful out of that. So that might be why this one feels a bit more slippery than some of the other uh, types of councils and regulatory things. Yeah, I mean, I think it also feels slippery because it arrives at a moment where the central question of our age is what does it mean to be human? So there's a bit of an irony here. We haven't, as a culture, settled that one and now we've got, and now we have. Oh, okay, well, hang on. Well, I don't know this burgeoning technology. Yeah, but but when did that become an actual existential question? What does it mean to be human? So I think the question, "What do I do with my life?" has always been out there, but fundamentally, as far sure. as I can yeah. tell through my short perusal of history over the last few decades, is that there wasn't the same level of angst of like, what is it to be one of what it is that I am? So, I mean, do you have any insight on that? Like, what is the history of, of, of this being in, like we've almost educated and techno technologized ourselves into Mm -hmm. this level of confusion. And now we're expecting technology and our material world to be the thing that gets us out of it. So it it seems like there's a certain feedback loop that's happening as we try to, Sure. Well, you know, Peter Kreeft in his usual felicitous way of phrasing things said, as a society, we are now an adolescent. We, we our, our culture is a culture of adolescence. We're asking questions like, who am I? Why am I here? You know, do people like me? And that runs the risk of, of trivializing a little bit. But it goes to your point. Yes, Nathan, I don't think, I think in the past, there were certain foundational aspects of life you could take for granted. And the notion of yeah, being human <laughs> would have been one of them. But, and we've mentioned this before, we are increasingly, I think one of the pictures that's helpful when we look at our cultural moment is that we now are unscripted. We've, we don't have, there is no shared script anymore. And I think in the past, that was portrayed as profoundly liberating. But Mm -hmm. I think now we're learning the hard lesson that it is also a tremendous burden because we don't know what to do. And so now it's not, on the one hand, it's it's not surprising. I I think you and I, Nathan, wouldn't wouldn't be very surprised that we've got a, a real mental health crisis happening right now because turns out human beings really do need meaning and purpose. I mean, it's like, it's food for our soul. It's it's, it's basic nourishment that we need. Deprived of that, we 
flounder, deprived of that, we're, we're really not doing well. And so that's why, back to that council, in order to have, re- I mean, you, this is why we really are going to need Christian voices in these sectors. You're going to need religious voices because pe- Christians have a tremendous stability here that's now all too rare in the culture. Because mm-hmm. we do we do have a story. We do have a clear understanding of who we are and whose we are. And those foundational issues, I mean, those those foundational commitments rather, give you, I mean, they prepare you very well to face some of these thorny questions. Yep. You can face them in a way that that others can't. So well, let me let me try need, a word picture here. Christians in on this conversation. That's good. yeah, yeah. Okay, so imagine a, a situation where uh, maybe you had a traditional society three hundred years ago, uh, and you can pick your part of the world that you think that's in, and, and and there's a certain degree of cultural cohesion. The concept of this is the way that things are done around here. You could go back a thousand years. I don't care. Just you know, and and imagine that as analogous to like a ship on the sea. So you have everybody who's in the same boat. And in fact, we use that as an idiom, right? They're all on the same page. They're all in the same boat that everybody is lumped together. And historically, that has been seen as a good thing and a stabilizing thing. And a phenomenal amount of security and identity comes from everybody being in the same boat together. So now picture that ship and the people in the boat say, well, you know, we're all in this thing together, but this seems restrictive. It seems collective. It doesn't value the individual enough. Um, I'm feeling repressed and I don't have the same level of freedom that I do. And I don't like what my parents think about things. So I'm going to do something else. And the ship starts to break apart. Um, Now you have a couple options. You can have lifeboats or you can say, everybody grab a life jacket and jump into the ocean. And it seems like culturally we're living at a moment where kind of the collective ships are, are sinking or have sunk and everybody's grabbed their life jacket and jumped into the ocean. And now instead of having 7,000 people in one boat, you just have 7,000 people with their life jacket bobbing in the ocean, going wherever the tides and the waves take them. And then there's an awakening that comes on the other side of that that says, okay, well, now I have my individual autonomy and freedom, and I'm not forced into the same structure by everybody else, but I don't like it. And so we're we're like this, the Mm -hmm. the radical individualism is, is coming to bear here where now we suddenly we're all bobbing in the ocean, like, okay, what do we do with ourselves? And how do we piece ourselves back? And that's not to say that every structure of the past was good or equitable or fair or just or wise. I'm not saying that at all. And some things do need to be taken apart because they weren't helpful. But now we're living in a time in which we're saying, how do we put this thing? How do we put things back together? And to do that, here you go. What does religion mean? It means to re-ligament. The ligaments are the things that attach the bones. It, it pieces all the things back together into a cohesive whole. And so mm-hmm. this is where the the limits of the, of the beauty or the curse of artificial intelligence will come into play is to say, does it become like I have a moral vision and I have a, a vision of community and I can use AI as a tool to help me enable this vision. That is different than saying I'm going to let AI develop the vision that I think we should all aspire to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and, and so th- those are very, very different. And, and that's not just our, for artificial intelligence. That's for your smartphone or your laptop or any other piece of technology. Is this a tool that's an enabling me to fulfill what I see to be the good and the true and the beautiful, or am I letting the technology tell me what is the good and the true and the beautiful to me? It kind of, that that's the best I can do for a word picture off the cuff of what it feels like in 2023. Yeah. So, I mean, we're at a place where innovation is outpacing our sense of purpose. And I think that's been going on here for, for quite a while. I mean, I would say you can have the introduction, something like the introduction of birth control technology, serious birth control technology in the 1960s. You could, I think you can make a case there's a major there's there's a kind of beginning phase to a lot of this where we are mm-hmm. completely now you have the ability to look at sex and completely separate it from its purpose 
I don't even want to use the word like function because function sounds <laughs> a little bit too mechanistic. I'm going to, I'm going to say purpose because sex is of course the author of sex is, is God himself and it has, but it has a telos. It has a, has a purpose. But when you take control of it by artificial means like that, now you've got to, I mean, you better believe. And I mean, obviously there are, there are discussions around that and, and, and around those practices, but it's, it's my, it's been my experience, Nathan, that Protestants don't necessarily have those conversations or think through the ethics there, but you better believe that a technology like that is going to seriously shape the way we think, reshape the way we think. So you have, you've got that. And now increasingly you have all of these innovations with, you know, from smartphones all the way to these, on, I mean, to just really just think about the internet and the online world in general that make it possible to reshape your life to, I mean, we have plastic surgery. I'm just naming some of the different technologies that go along okay. with this innovation outpacing our sense of meaning and purpose where we can, we can mold and shape, but think again, in the with with in the absence of a script, you used a compel. You had a sort of provocative way of looking at it, Nathan. Where you're you're talking about almost we get into a place where our technologies start to lead us rather, and that's man. That that I mean I don't know. I have the almost the image of a person getting in a car, taking their hands off the wheel, and just pressing down on the accelerator there. Oh yeah, but I mean, so you're you're foreseeing the driverless car, which is already out there. But okay. Here's yeah, of course. All, yeah. that to, you know, all that to say, though, this is why I'm not super concerned about artificial intelligence. And maybe I'm being naive here, but it doesn't hmm. seem to be. So it's it's amazing. But the, the, the reason that it works is because of the the way in which it can be customizable and individualized. And so it, I, I don't see communities being formed as the byproduct of artificial intelligence. Now, interest groups, sure, but it seems to me that it will lead to a more radical isolation and individualism that ultimately isn't going to satisfy the desires that we have as humans for common vision, common story, common meaning, common purpose. And so I, so, so artificial intelligence can build everybody a customized life jacket, but I don't believe it can build a ship that has a, a, a functional mm -hmm. collective to it or even a destination or a purpose. So to those who are pursuing disconnect is going to be a wonderful thing for a short amount of time uh, until you recognize that artificial intelligence is going to build a life for you that you can't live in. So, uh, it, it, or am I missing something there? If you're only using artificial intelligence for your identity formation, I'd, I think it's only going to be able to accelerate the trajectory that we're already on. It's, I, yeah, mm. I, for, for some reason, from what I know about how humans work and function, this doesn't seem to be an existential threat to me. People are going to get hurt for sure. A couple of items there. I think, I don't know that it's nece necessarily an existential threat. I think, will there be job displacement? Yes. I think that's very clear. That's already happening. That's nothing new either doesn't make it any less painful, but it's, you know, you know, the advent of new technology usually ushers in job displacement, but that will happen. I think there are part of it is there, there will be a lot of unpredictable outcomes, Nathan. We just don't know. I mean, who would have predicted all of, I mean, you can take, I mean, you can basically pick and choose any technology and look at all the unforeseen consequences, but you can take a smartphone. Who would have predicted the world that we live in now with smartphones? So I'm going to kind of disagree with you. While it's true that we can't get the true community, say, that we need, real thick, true, what, we would, what you and I would recognize as a real community from, from these technologies, it is the case, though, we've seen this already, that the online world has fostered many, I don't know, what do you want to call them, superficial communities, community substitutes. They may not be the real thing, but they do function as the, as the real... But functionally, they, they, they count as the real thing for many people. And what we do have is a world of serious isolation and loneliness. My, I suppose one of my overall concerns with AI, apart from 
I mean, I just think the the velocity, the speed with which these things move is dangerous because it <laughs> we have we have less and less time to make informed decisions. So there's that. There's the speed with which it moves. There are the unpredictable elements. There's no getting around that. That's the way innovation works. But also, I fear that AI will lead further to the diminishment of our view of, of what it means to be a person. We already have a tendency nowadays to look at human beings as glorified computers. I mean, on, on the one hand, I do think, so artificial intelligence, you got to call this something. It's as good a phrase as anything. But on the other hand, and I'm, we mentioned this before in another podcast, human consciousness there is nothing even remotely comparable to human consciousness in the digital world at all. We're not talking about a difference in degree. We're talking about a difference in kind. Nothing and nothing of the kind will ever or can ever happen. I realize that's a debatable statement, but I'm going to, I would categorically deny that you can in any way produce human, con, you know, an artificial or a duplicate or some kind of a consciousness you know, surrogate in the digital world. To say that we can is to fundamentally misunderstand the mystery of consciousness. But the sad fact is many people do look at human beings, do misunderstand consciousness, do take for, I mean, do overlook the miracle that is consciousness, that is your awareness. I mean, we we can't, yeah, I could go on and on about okay, what okay. wonder well, it is, but we do overlook that wonder. Yeah. Well, let, let me mill around in an idea here. So, part of the part of the beauty of human consciousness is that it doesn't function in isolation just within the individual i mean your consciousness does but the purpose of the consciousness is fundamentally for relationship and engaging the world external to yourself mm -hmm. so let's to bring it back around to the advisory committee or the regulatory um i don't need a mm. when i when i look at my life i don't need a regulatory committee i need an advisory committee uh, or think of it this way I am not nearly smart enough, wise enough, capable enough, nor do I have enough experience to be able to answer all of my own questions. I, it, part of what it means to be human is that I need external perspectives on who I am in order to understand myself from other conscious minds. So it, it seems to me that the technological drive tries to mirror consciousness as an individual without thinking about the way in which it relates to other beings so there's a there's a mm. to, to, to me because i have a, a an inherently collective sense of what it means to be human that i that i lump us together there are some degrees to which i'm not impressed by technology just yet and its ability to replicate that however if you have a highly individualistic view of what it means to be human then there are some technological surrogates for that i think Yes, and many people by default, many of us do have a highly individualistic view. But I'll, I've said this before on the podcast, you are, you listener, and me and Nathan, are unimaginable as a discrete atomistic unit. You are not monadic. You wouldn't even be here, of course, apart from relationships. <laughs> Don't have to tell you that. And those relationships most certainly did not involve a stork. But apart from that, you wouldn't be who you are without the people who make you who you are. Mm -hmm. And other people wouldn't be who they are without you playing a part in making them. That is what it means to be a person. And you're right, Nathan. We Not only do we often take that for granted, we increasingly overlook it, but also we find that the more we live in forms of modern isolation, the more we find ourselves basically starving and deeply diminished. Yeah. And that's not the way it's meant to be. Well, I was just thinking of the, this is also part of the reason that people find counseling to be so helpful often is to have somebody who sure. isn't so closely connected that they can kind of zoom out and see a bigger picture and help you organize things. Um, you're talking about advisory councils uh, as a few years ago, I think um, the American bee lab. So if you look at the USDA research on honeybees and their vitality to American agriculture, um, they were just running into these roadblocks. And so what they did was they hired a bunch of people who knew nothing about bees, but were really good researchers to say, can you come in and evaluate the processes we're using to do this research? And so here you took scientists from one field 
who weren't entomologists, but they knew how the science was supposed to work. And because they didn't get distracted by all this other knowledge, they had a, a broader view that they helped them work out a couple of kinks. And I thought, actually, that's really cool to bring in somebody who knows how the procedure is supposed to work, who isn't going to get distracted by the details and can, can help sort things out. So I think hopefully that same sort of thing can be done on a on an AI level where it's not just the, I mean, if if you only have a committee working on AI that is obsessed with technology, that's a recipe for disaster. You have to have mm. somebody who's going to be able yeah. to come in to say, here's how humans function basically and not get distracted by the details um, and be able to speak into that. But I would say that that for me is exactly how the church functions also in my life is if I, I don't think of it as a regulatory committee, I think of it as an advisory committee of saying, hey, here's some some general parameters of things that you can't see. Here's the collective experience that we have. Here's some wisdom. Don't do that. It hurts when you touch it. Trust us, we know. Um, that is, is, I, I guess is, I guess the, the future question isn't going to be whether or not there's regulation or whether or not you have advisory systems or committees in your life. It's who are they going to be? So we can we can look at it and have qualms or irritations about it at the government level, but we all live in systems where other people are helping us make sense of the world. So I would say uh, there's a way in which we can flip this around and, and make it personal and think about who is it that we want to allow to speak into our lives and who do we trust to know enough to point us in the right direction. So there's a twist. Yeah, definitely worth thinking about. And a subject to which we will no doubt return because, my goodness, we're going to see more and more in that field. You've been listening to Thinking Out Loud, a podcast where we think out loud about current events and Christian hope. Thanks for listening to Thinking Out Loud. If you'd like to learn more about what we do, book Nathan or Cameron, or if you'd like to support us financially, whether through a one-time donation or on a monthly basis, you can do so on the donate page at www.toltogether.com. That's toltogether.com. And please consider leaving us a five-star rating and sharing this content with your friends. It really does help.